good morning, uh, everybody here in Washington, and uh, good evening, our colleagues in the Tiger Range countries in India, Vietnam, and uh, Nepal. Uh, my name is Andrei Kushlin. I'm the program coordinator for the Global Tiger Initiative here at the World Bank. And let me welcome all of you to our special event here on behalf of the Global Tiger Initiative Secretariat. Uh, this is a kind of a hybrid event that uh, is a stock taking at uh, one year after the very inspiring uh, St. Petersburg Tiger Summit, which happened exactly a year and less than a week ago in St. Petersburg. Uh, and uh, that's uh, the subject that we will today try to take informal stock of uh, moving from political commitment to action on the ground. And the more formal exercise for that will be uh, taking place in, a, in about three months in Asia as a ministerial conference. And it is combined with a deeper, more expert focus on one of the key themes and threats uh, that is being addressed by the Global Tiger Initiative, and that's the escalating scourge of illegal wildlife trade. There's been a, a number of important developments in this area, and uh, our guests and speakers and panelists here today will, will delve into that. Uh, the event is jointly organized by the World Bank Institute and the Sustainable Development Network of the World Bank. And uh, unfortunately, our Vice President for, uh, for World Bank Institute, Mr. Sanjay Pradhan, is traveling today, so he cannot be with us, but he's passing his best wishes and regards to everyone. And we uh, very much appreciate his uh, strong support to what we are doing and uh, for the entire management team. A couple of remarks about the housekeeping and uh, running order. Uh, we are going to have a very, very tight and packed program today. It is compounded, well, we, we are going to have in a few minutes uh, the president of the World Bank, Mr. Zelik, join us. There is a video connection with three countries. We, you see them on the screen here, India, uh, Nepal, and Vietnam. Uh, there are special guests here representing the US government and the Russian government. Uh, and then we are, uh, this is going to be followed by a, a panel of experts uh, who are seated all in front of us here. And then at the end, at 12 noon, we will move from here to a very special artistic event celebrating the occasion. Uh, this will be the piano recital, and it will be downstairs at the atrium of the main building. So uh, considering that it's a very tight schedule, uh, each speaker or each location has exactly not more than five minutes to speak. So be very concise. We'll make an exception for Mr. Zelik. He may speak a little longer. Uh, and, uh, but the, otherwise, the five-minute limit will be strictly enforced by our moderator, Kesha Varma. Uh, I'm reminding every speaker, be it a panelist here or a, a VC, to push the button before they speak. Otherwise, they will not be heard uh, to ensure that the technology works. And time permitting, at the end, we'll have a few Q&As. Uh, take uh, from here and from the VC, and then we'll go, as I said, to the Joy of Nature music recital. Now, let me introduce our chair for today, uh, Rachel Kite. She is the Vice President of the Sustainable Development Network of the World Bank, and that part of the World Bank is really the main arm uh, responsible for mainstreaming what Global Tiger Initiative is uh, trying to achieve through innovations, knowledge exchange, partnerships and to mainstream it into World Bank operations uh, more largely. Uh, that includes uh, infrastructure strategies, inf uh, environment strategies, uh, energy rural development strategies, safeguard policies, uh, climate finance instruments, etc. Uh, Rachel also brings with her rich experience from her previous job as the Vice President of IFC, the International Finance Corporation, working with private sector, business models, sustainability agenda, and benchmarking, including corporate social responsibility. Uh, the famously globally known equator principles are something that uh, Rachel has been very closely associated with putting together. So hopefully sometime soon will it lead us all to business, to tiger business standards. And uh, Rachel has also been uh, previously a, a member of the managing team of the IUCN. So Rachel, uh, the floor is yours. Please welcome our chair, Rachel Kite. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you to everybody who's come from outside the bank, all of our partners and friends. 
Uh, I'm very pleased and honoured to address uh, all of you, uh, um, the stakeholders in this Global Tiger Initiative. Your work over the last three years really makes this one of the most visible and valuable World Bank efforts on biodiversity. Within the bank, uh, the Global Tiger Initiative is really a unique uh, entry point to our work on biodiversity and the green growth agenda. So today we commemorate the anniversary of the historic St. Petersburg Tiger Summit and the progress that's been made in the Tiger Range countries since then. We will also have a substantive conversation about the growing problem of illegal wildlife trade. This trade is rapidly becoming more sophisticated, driven by a huge market demand for wildlife products. Tigers are not the only species under threat. Last year alone, between January and October, poachers killed almost 230 rhinoceros in South Africa. Traffic, and I'm delighted that they're here with us today, Traffic International suggests that the value of the global illegal trade, based on figures from the early 90s, ranges from four to eight billion annually. We can only imagine what that is with updated numbers and with a greater insight into the flow of that trade. Crime against wildlife is seen as opportunistic. Why? Because wildlife is undervalued, never insured, rarely guarded, and easy to cash and carry. Given this, we at the bank see the need to re-engage in law enforcement to defend and support the rights-based management approaches being applied to conserve biodiversity. Therefore, we are moving more from examining the drivers of trade to actively applying our financing, convening power and technical assistance to intercept that trade. We're also embracing conservation criminology, an approach to combating environmental crime that supports the interception and arrest of those engaged in the illegal wildlife trade. It is an integral part of the governance and anti-corruption agenda so important to sustainable development more broadly, and I think very important to the trade and sustainable development agenda. So fire must be fought with fire. Beyond that, let me also remind you quickly of how the World Bank has taken this agenda forward with your spirit uh, behind us. The principles and innovations established in the work program of GTI, the Global Tiger Recovery Program, are gradually becoming integrated into bank operations. We have an IDA project in Nepal and Bangladesh to strengthen regional cooperation, and we are providing support to Interpol for Project Predator, which you will hear much more about later this morning. 2010 was the year of the tiger. It was also the year of biodiversity. And last November in Nagoya, the United Nations held its COP10. There, the bank spoke of how important it is to create a global standard methodology that will quantify and calculate the economic value of ecosystems and biodiversity. Our acronym for this work is WAVES. We launched the Global Partnership for Ecosystems and Ecosystem Services Valuation and Wealth Accounting. We see it as, a criti as critical to place an economic value on these systems and services and move that value into national accounting practices. Only then will we be able to turn the tide of unsustainable behaviours and practices. WAVES will really be one of our, um, uh, I think, most important contributions as well to the Rio Plus 20 process, which we're just uh, embarking on, which will take us to Rio in June next year. Today, conservation practitioners and park managers will join us by video from Nepal, India, and Vietnam. They will shed light on the wildlife crime epidemic, share their experiences, and highlight areas where they need help. I am very grateful to Bob Zellick. Not only is he joining us to discuss some of the challenges and solutions faced by these Tiger Range countries, but it is no secret to those of you, our partners, that without his unstinting, visionary approach to this species and what this species, species means for landscape uh, interventions and for biodiversity overall, we wouldn't be where we are today. I think it's quite extraordinary to have somebody with his biodiversity vision leading such an important international financial institution. Before we go to those countries, though, I would like to introduce Keshav Varma, who is the Programme Director for the Global Tiger Initiative. He's much more than that, as you know. He's a tiger himself, and he has um, aggressively pursued this agenda with the grace and speed that the tiger in the wild also displays. Keshav, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Good morning, Rachel. Thank you very much uh, 
for your very, for chairing this event and for your comments. Excellencies, uh, Honorable Under Secretary, uh, Excellencies, Ambassadors, Executive Directors of the Bank, my dear partners who have given GTI a very unique position across the world. The event celebrates today the first anniversary of the International Tiger Forum that was held in St. Petersburg. I would really like to thank the Russian Federation, Mr. Putin's leadership, and support from the embassy and all the officers for making this success a historic event. The strong collaboration as we move forward with our partners is perhaps the most significant issue to talk about. <clears throat> GTI, the Global Tiger Initiative, was launched in 2008. It was founded on several guiding principles that our partners and our colleagues in the World Bank uh, developed. One is the sharp sense of urgency to stop the bleeding. There is a range-wide collapse, and we have only 3,200 tigers left across 13 tiger range countries. The other was to promote the principle of collaboration rather than competition. In this sector, there is more competition. There are few battles that we win, but we have been losing the war. We, had to, we have to collaborate. We have to con create convergence uh, and a converging platform to come together. And most important, important is empowering and reinforcing the Tiger Range countries who actually are fighting these problems in a very complex and complex problems across in the field. And creating a sense of unity and trust to find shared solutions. And of course, creating innovation and resources. Essentially, we have been trying to <clears throat> talk about a change in conversation, how the earlier conversations needed to be further enhanced, that we needed to bring the external externalities that are influencing tiger uh, habitats, and to create an understanding, and also ensure that GTI remains a platform for creativity and innovation. <coughs> Excuse me. The most important issue was to ensure the political will. Without the political will at the highest level, which can influence policy, there is no hope. And what St. Petersburg gave us is the political will. On innovations, we have been rather active with SDN and WBI. We have come out with ideas such as the wildlife premium market that is now being rolled out into different tiger range countries. We have ideas on uh, smart green infrastructure. Myself, uh, having worked in East Asia for 12 years, this is one of the issues that confronts us. There's almost $600 billion of infrastructure being created that has to be eco-sensitive and eco-friendly. And hopefully, and uh, I say Crawford and Richard and others have just come back from Hong Kong on curbing demand, which is showing a surge. So the St. Petersburg Declaration provided the mandate and the direction. Now we have to move towards action on the front lines where the tiger conservation will succeed or fail. We have the following common challenges that have emerged out of the National Tiger Recovery Programs, pressure of infrastructure development, inadequate resources and equipment, limited engagement of local communities, ineffective management systems and technologies in many protected areas, lack of proper communication, and poor awareness about the ongoing wildlife and tiger crisis, an epidemic of poaching and illegal trade and traffic trafficking in tiger parts and products in all types of wildlife. To be effective, we must have sustained political will. We must scale up as far as the capacity building is concerned, impact, and we must ensure impact on the ground. We have been having several con conferences. We have had the summit. But the most important issue here is to remove the disconnect between the global and the local. All the global knowledge and all that we are doing has to connect to local practice, and that is the essence of it. And that is the, all the legitimacy all these conferences would ever uh, have if we can create an outcome on the ground. International, tra the illegal trade and traffic and poaching, however, continues. We don't want to leave our children's natural heritage in the hands of criminals. What are the solutions? And I am using a word 
taking direct action to hunt down poachers and traffickers. I liked what uh, Rachel just said. We've got to fight fire with fire. And we cannot be cute on this, um, on this uh, issue because the poachers are showing more organization, more sophistication, and a great amount of aggressiveness. So we have to work hard on this issue. I'd like to now stop here because we have the presence of our uh, honorable president, uh, who has, in the last few years, absolutely changed the dynamics of wildlife, wild tiger conservation. I'd like to really thank Mr. Zelik and welcome him here. We have the three countries, sir, uh, who are Nepal, Vietnam, and India, and they are, uh, they'll be interacting with you, but I'd like to invite you to the podium to say a few words to all our partners. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Kishov, and thanks to all of you uh, for joining us. Um, it's a great pleasure to have an opportunity uh, to welcome you to the World Bank today to recognize the first anniversary of the St. Petersburg Summit on Tiger Conservation, to have a chance to review some of what we've done, uh, but also consider uh, the path ahead. I'd like to thank uh, Rachel Kite uh, for chairing this important gathering, Fighting Fire with Fire, it appears, is the theme, uh, as well as uh, Kishoff and his tireless Global Tiger Initiative team for the organization. I'd like to give a special thanks to all the, dis the distinguished guests, in particular the participants uh, on our expert panel who will share some of their experience and expertise and help us brainstorm for solutions to the illegal wildlife crisis. Um, and our representation from the Tiger Range countries who are joining us from video conference from India, Nepal, and Vietnam. I know it's very late in the evening for all of you, so I'm especially grateful that you would take the time to be with us here in Washington. Uh, last year's summit was an extraordinary event. It was the first ever meeting of uh, world leaders to address the fate of a non-human species. Hosted by Prime Minister Putin, the meeting brought together prime ministers from five Tiger Range countries, ministers from all 13 Tiger Range countries, leaders of international organizations, and celebrities from around the world. We, we came to St. Petersburg because we shared a common belief, and that is that saving wild tigers matters. It matters not only because these are magnificent and beautiful animals, but also because tigers are a barometer of ecosystem health and a cornerstone of the natural capital in the countries in which they live. Tigers are guides in assessing the biodiversity of the planet. The summit was able to mobilize political, financial, and celebrity support behind the goal of doubling the numbers of wild tigers to at least 7,000 by the year 2022, the next year of the tiger. All the Tiger Range countries adopted the St. Petersburg Declaration on Tiger Conservation, committing them to, among other things, protecting the remaining tiger habitats, some of the last great expanses of forests in Asia, and eradicating poaching and the illegal trade in tiger parts and products. The World Bank and other international organizations are committed to support these efforts. Now, all too often, promises and pledges don't necessarily lead to concrete action. What matters are results. So one year on from the St. Petersburg Summit, what's changed for the future of tigers? A first important step in the Global Tiger Recovery Program has been endorsed, is that it's be, the actions has been endorsed by the national cabinets in all 13 of the Tiger Range countries with commitments of full support. This means that the political will that was generated in Russia is influencing public policy in countries' capitals. It's also affecting change on the ground. Over the past year, all the Tiger Range countries have strengthened their wildlife protection laws, they've increased patrolling teams, and they've conducted intensive training of their frontline staff, and in some cases also created and strengthened institutions to address wildlife crimes. Russia, for example, has now banned the logging of the Korean pine, which is a key food source for tiger prey. Russia has also increased the resources for rangers and empowered rangers 
with full enforcement rights. Some Tiger Range countries have created more reserves, or they've expanded the size of the existing ones, and defined critical corridors between reserves that need to be protected. India has enlarged the area of its Tiger Reserves by 5% to a total of 55,000 square kilometers. After a nationwide census, India has reported a modest increase in tiger numbers from 1,411 to 1,706. This is good news, but it's tempered by the fact that tigers are using less area outside the tiger reserves than they were five years ago. Bhutan, Nepal, India, and others have developed and strengthened mechanisms to increase community support for tiger conservation. Some of the actions have included sharing the benefits from tourism or forestry with communities and strengthening the response to conflict between tiger and local communities. Twelve tiger range countries have either renewed existing bilateral and regional alliances or they form new ones so as to cooperate both on wildlife law enforcement and in managing the transboundary tiger landscapes. Malaysia, Indonesia, Bhutan, and the People's Democratic Republic of Laos are exploring options for smart green infrastructure so that development activities can proceed without sacrificing biodiversity. The international partners are fulfilling their part of the bargain too. Support from GTI partners to the Tiger Range countries is now better focused and better organized. We've created the International Consortium for Combating Wildlife Crime to support the efforts, among other nations, of Tiger Range countries to fight illegal trade and trafficking in all wildlife. This group is made up of the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, CITES, Interpol, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, World Customs Organization, and the World Bank Group. In addition, the strategic partnership between GTI and the Smithsonian is focusing on training frontline staff in smart patrolling, tracking, and surveillance. Project Predator is a significant new wildlife crime fighting effort led by Interpol and supported by USAID, the World Bank Group, as well as the UK's Department for Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs, the Smithsonian, and others. Launched earlier this month at the 80th Interpol General Assembly in Vietnam, Predator's goal is to support and enhance governance and law enforcement capacity in tiger range countries so that the authorities can put the heat on traffickers and tigers <coughs> and other wildlife and to try to break up the criminal syndicates. We've also been making progress on increasing resources to help countries reach their tiger conservation goals. The tiger range countries are seeking $350 million in external funding to implement the recovery program over the next year. So far, close to half that amount, about $160 million, is approved or in the pipeline with the World Bank's International Development Association and the Global Environmental Facility as being major contributors. Another potential source of new funding for tiger conservation could be the Wildlife Premium Market Initiative, which we've been pioneering with the World Wildlife Fund. Two pilot projects to test that concept, one in Nepal and another in Thailand, are under development, and we're planning to create a readiness fund to help finance other pilots. I'm also finding interest in bilateral donors, and meetings like this certainly assist by demonstrating the seriousness and the results of this effort. But there's still a long way to go to bring back the wild tigers. First, infrastructure development continues to impinge on tiger habitats. At the World Bank, we pledged not to finance any infrastructure projects or development that harm critical natural habitats, including key tiger habitats. Models for smart green infrastructure are providing us ways to be able to operationalize this pledge and ensure that development and protection can coexist. But to be effective, these models need to become part of the public policy of all Tiger Range countries and international financial institutions, both public and private. Second, demand for Tiger parts and products remains unacceptably high. And as a result, poaching and illegal trade and trafficking remains a large and growing problem. 
we're going to have to tackle this problem from both ends. Innovative ideas to try to reduce the demand for wildlife parts, and stronger support on the supply side from national law enforcement authorities to enforce wildlife laws and catch wildlife criminals who act outside of protected areas, as well as effective cross-border, regional, and global cooperation to stop the illegal wildlife trade. Third, human and financial resources still remain far insufficient to address the size of threats to biodiversity. While the World Bank has managed more than $6.5 billion worth of conservation investments since 1992, wildlife and wilderness remain undervalued and overexploited. As a result, we've begun to think about ways to transform how natural capital can be valued. For example, we're currently piloting the Wealth Accounting and Valuation of Ecosystem Services, or WAVES program. WAVES is developing the tools that countries need to be able to integrate the economic benefits of their ecosystems into their own national accounting systems. Using this system, decision makers will be able to see the value of green economic growth. Our new ocean initiative will improve governance of the oceans to support food security, overcome poverty, and boost economic growth. We've also created a new community of practice on wildlife law enforcement and environmental crime. This complements the work that we do on safeguarding natural habitats. So these initiatives will help create the enabling conditions for effective tiger conservation. So we're at a critical point in this campaign. We won some important early battles, but to turn the tide, we truly have to transform the dynamics of tiger conservation. At the policy level, we're going to have to sustain the political will and momentum created at St. Petersburg. To this end, I'll reach out to Prime Minister Putin and others to find ways to keep tigers and biodiversity high on the national and international agendas. We're also going to have to continue to give the highest level of support to those who do the real work of conserving tigers in their habitats, the men and women on the ground, on the front line in protected areas. These people need our cooperation, encouragement, and recognition. So I'd like now to turn to our participants from the three, three tiger range countries. I'm particularly interested in hearing your views about what's happening on the ground, where you've seen progress over the past year, and where there are setbacks. Most importantly, what do you consider to be the major challenges looking ahead over the next year? And what can we do to continue to support you? Thank you. Mr. Zelig, thank you very much. And with the permission of the chair, may I now invite uh, Nepal. Uh, the delegation is headed by Mr. Krishna Acharya, Director General, Department of National Parks, Ministry of Forestry and Soil Conservation, and Maheshwar Dhakal. Over to Nepal, please. Please uh, speak into the mic. Uh, thank you, Kesar. Uh, Your Excellencies, President of the World Bank, distinguished colleagues, we are very delighted to share our achievements and challenges we faced after St. Petersburg Summit. After the summit, Nepal succeeded to allocate about US dollar six million for tiger conservation for the next five years. We are giving very high priority to infrastructure development, such as construction of new posts and all other roads in our park and nearby uh, forest area where Tiger live. Nepal made important success to control poaching and illegal trade on rhino and tiger. For your confirmation, we have three parks where rhino and tiger share the same habitat. Since last 10 months, we arrested about 200 people including 35 cases, uh, which include five tiger cases. Since last January 3, 2011, it is almost 11, 11 months that we have no poaching of uh, rhino uh, from the uh, out park or from the forest. So it is very important achievement. And we think that it is because of setting up several institutional mechanisms, for example, Wildlife Crime Control Bureau, Coordination Committee, National Tiger Conservation Committee, enhanced communication and coordination between different agencies, and information and intelligence sharing of agencies. With the establishment of SAIWIN, Secretary in Nepal, uh, we are committed to make uh, it a common forum for the law enforcement in South Asia and make 
making it supportive to contribute to our common goal of doubling the tiger. It is our pleasure to uh, let you know or share that we have already launched the regional IDA project in Nepal. We sincerely thank uh, to the World Bank team for the project. We are holding regular transformative meeting with our neighboring, uh, particularly India and China, which are very important for tiger conservation. This year we have started Nepal Tiger Genome Project, which, will, which is a non detrimental genetic study and believe that it will generate sensible scientific studies. The involvement of local communities in various buffer zone activities is highly crucial and very important to achieve the, the doubling the tiger objectives. Altogether, there are about 631,000 people live, living in and around the tiger bearing protected areas in Nepal. We have started a relief mechanism to wildlife victims, uh, though we started with, with a small amount. A new commitment has been made by the local community to our response. Uh, we have very good example that from western part of the Nepal, Bharatiya National Park, which is one of the very important tiger habitat. Communities have handed over their weapons, the guns, and in the last eight months we have, uh, we have a figure that uh, they handed over 135 such guns to the park authorities. Nepal is also revising the royalty rate on the park interns, which will ultimately contribute to benefit to the local community in terms of uh, more, uh, revenue, more revenue and money. There are some issues which need immediate attention to tiger conservation in Nepal, such as we need infrastructure of tiger bearing potty area. Is, uh, they are existing are very old and poor, and they even doesn't meet the minimum condition for David daily living of the front line staff. Uh, this is a very priority in our agenda. Strengthening of Sabin and promotion is linkage to other uh, similar regional organizations, for example, ASEAN WIN or Interpol, GTI, OECD, and others is very important. Similarly, the you know, a mechanism to generate financial and technical support to Sabin is also very crucial. Immediate relief package to the wildlife victims and rapid compensation mechanism and package also is very important. We are working on this and need to be addressed very soon. The invasive species distressing, uh, you know, damaging the tiger prey habitat is also very crucial to address in the days to come. Encroachment, over dependency of local communities on protected areas, and eventually constantly increasing conflict between human and wildlife. Obviously, if we are protecting better in, in the uh, management of the protected area, there will be more animals and there will be more, you know, coming confrontation or conflict between human and wildlife. So it is very important issue. And these are very, always has been remained a chronic problem in uh, Nepal. Uh, Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, we would like to sincerely thanks for this, uh, giving this opportunity to share our achievements and challenges for tiger conservation in Nepal. We encourage such kind of, you know, sharing in the days to come. Uh, we also have, uh, no, I think we can ask some questions as <laughs> well. We also have, uh, we'd like to know, as the President Zelik mentioned about, you know, this uh, wildlife premium market in Cancun, and uh, we are actually hoping to know more about when the, you know, we will really start it, we will start this on the ground, so that we can convince people there will be more additional funding to come. And we also are eager uh, to know, actually, whether there will be more additional funding really on the ground, for uh, ground activities, so for, uh, you know, those identified in Tiger Recovery Program, yes, we are almost lacking by one-third of the projected initial five-year uh, funding requirements. So that's very crucial, actually, to move ahead with our challenges to meet tiger conservation activities in Nepal. Thank so you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you. Mr. Krishna Acharya, thank you very much for your detailed description of what progress you are making. May I now request uh, his Excellency, the Honorable Vice Minister of Natural Resources and Environment, Mr. Tuyen, uh, to make the presentation from Vietnam. And with him is Mr. Dong, who is the Deputy Director General, Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, and his other colleagues. Thank you very much. We'll keep it to five minutes. Uh, Honorable President of the World Bank, Mr. Robert P. Zolik. Honorable Vice President of the World Bank, Mr. Reiko Kite, Program Director of Global Tiger Initiative of the World Bank, uh, Mr. Kesha Vahma, uh, the Country Director of the World Bank in Vietnam, Ms. Victoria Kwa Kwa, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. 
It is an honor to have the opportunity to participate in the video conference to evaluate the situation after one year of, after the Tiger submit. Thank you for uh, thank you for inviting me and my colleagues from Vietnam to this important event. We appreciate the support and coordination by the World Bank with the Tiger Ranch countries to save global tiger from the brink of extinction in our lifetime and on efforts made by all of you to prevent such a tragedy. The St. Petersburg Declaration, Vietnam's national priorities, and the global program we are recognized and supported Vietnam by Vietnam central government for implementation. Since the Tiger Submit, Vietnam has set out the priority actions to implement in 2011, and we have gained a number of major achievements during the first year of implementing the declaration, which include, firstly, the government decree on endangered species criteria and its management have been developed and submitted for approval. The decree will be critical for endangered species conservation and will be issued with the list of endangered species prioritized for protection. And tiger will be on the top of the list. Secondly, three MOUs on strengthening enforcement and control of trans borders illegal wildlife threat have been signed by local provincial authorities of Vietnam and neighboring provinces of uh, Lao BDR and Cambodia last May 2011. Thirdly, Vietnam has successfully organized the first ceremony of the Global Tiger Day aimed at improving the public awareness on tiger conservation and encouraging public participation in tackling illegal threat and reducing the demand for tiger and other endangered species. The event mobilized the collective performances by different sectors, including the youth union and special school children and NGOs. In addition, <clears throat> the cross-sectoral roundtable with participation of uh, conservation communities, forestry, police, custom, justice, interpol, health sectors and NGOs on tiger issues was also successfully held last August. The roundtable aimed at leveraging more active roles from all relevant ministries and organizations in dealing with the issues. During this year, Vietnam has also conducted the initial survey on potential tiger landscape at five priority areas. The result of the survey will be the basis for selection of the most potential area for further comprehensive survey and evaluation to establish the demonstration site for tiger conservation in Vietnam. Finally, with the strong support from World Bank in Vietnam, we developed successfully a one million US dollar project proposal. The CEO of GEF just approved last week and implementation of this project will contribute greatly to reduce the demand of, for illegal wildlife in Vietnam. Based on the initial achievement and with the desire to keep this momentum going together with the World Bank and our TRCs in the coming years, Vietnam would strongly request the World Bank GTI to continue your coordination drones and provide support to Vietnam in implementing the National Tiger Recovery Program, including one, implement the contents of the biodiversity law, two, strengthen the enforcement on tiger and wildlife crime, three, establish the tiger conservation demonstration site, and four, improve knowledge and awareness to our tiger and wildlife conservation and at reducing the demand. As the country strongly support the GTI at the beginning, we would like to share your view on the following question. What is the future of GTI? What is the outlook for longer term, more sustainable financing for tiger conservation? And what is the bank plan to support the Tiger Ranch country to implement GTRB and NTRB?
Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Uh, may I now turn to the delegation, uh, Dr. S.P. Yadav, who is the CEO and Deputy Inspector General of NTCA, and his colleague, uh, Dr. H.S. Negi, who is the former field director of the Kanan uh, Tiger Reserve, uh, to make their remark. Thank you. Thank you, Keshav. Mr. President, Excellencies, and all distinguished delegates, India has a pioneering as well as long-standing experience in tiger conservation. This has also amply highlighted the need for tiger range countries to jointly address the issues relating to wild tigers. The Global Tiger Initiative undoubtedly brought together one and all the TRCs as well as all concerned people and organizations together on the same platform. We compliment President Zelik and his team for this. Uh, we are striving to make our core critical area inviolate by relocating 48,000 people from these areas based on voluntary, generous, and incentive-based program. We have created a special tiger protection force in 13 tiger range countries to strengthen our protection. We are also doing a pilot project on electronic surveillance in one of our tiger reserves. We have also done scientific monitoring and estimation of our tigers, and the tiger numbers have gone up significantly from 1,411 to 1,706. We extend our invitation to President Zelik for visiting a tiger reserve in our country during his next visit to India, and the best time, I would suggest, would be March, uh, in the coming March. Uh, my question would be, the what role the World Bank can play in promoting scientific estimation of tiger population across tiger range countries, and also the independent management effectiveness evaluation of tiger reserves across the globe? Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Dr. Yadav, thank you very much. And you actually finished in three and a half minutes, which is really commendable. Compress the India program into that. Uh, may I now uh, uh, request President Zelik to respond to the three Tiger Range countries, please? Well, I want to thank um, each of you for uh, participating. I think everybody in this room recognizes um, the critical role that your and other Tiger Range countries have. Um, and indeed, I think uh, your involvement and indeed leadership will be the key to the success. When people ask me uh, what distinguishes this initiative from some of the others in wildlife or tiger efforts in the past, uh, the key point that stands out to me is the active uh, engagement and leadership and practical on the ground work of the Tiger Range countries. We've got some great people from scientific community, NGO community, getting some of the development partners. We've got bilateral support. But as we've seen in other areas of development, none of this works unless you get local ownership. And so I think what uh, distinguishes this effort is the fact that each of the Tiger Range countries have developed their own plan. It's an integrated approach. And we're now at the key point of, of trying to support it. Um, Nepal has been uh, one of our best partners from the start uh, across different governments, and I'm really delighted uh, you've been able to maintain the momentum. It's great news uh, about the rhino uh, population. But I also think uh, your uh, report suggests the ongoing challenge we have on habitats, uh, communities, the critical role of law enforcement, and something that this project has also engaged us with was the key role of regional cooperation. So you've seen some references to our ability to deploy some of our IDA funds, which are funds for the poorest countries. We've been able to do this because we have some funds set aside for regional efforts. And in South Asia, countries have led the way by demonstrating uh, an overall uh, cooperation um, that I hope we can build on in uh, Southeast Asia as well. Um, you mentioned the wildlife premium. This is an idea that I think uh, at least the World Wildlife Fund was one of the first, if not the first, uh, promoters of this. Um, 
in the past few weeks, I've had a chance uh, to meet with some of the people from the World Wildlife Fund on, on this. And I think we very much share a view, which is we have to take this concept and now put it into practical action. Um, all of you are aware that the conference in Durban on climate change is just beginning this week. The wildlife premium was the idea of trying to build this on top of the work that was done in red and avoided deforestation. Um, now, there's so many other demands. Uh, what we believe will be critical is to show that this works. And so um, we've been working with the World Wildlife Fund uh, right now on uh, a project in Thailand with the support of uh, the Jeff, which will help develop, develop some of the capacity and the incentives in the Western Forest Complex. And at least my understanding is that it would be wonderful to have a similar pilot in the case of Nepal. I think the Nepal WWF uh, is a uh, interested partner, and I think USAID has also been looking to try to see how it might support this. What we've seen in this area and in many others is um, good ideas uh, are not uh, going to get us there by themselves. We have to be able to put the idea into practice, then we have to test it, we have to learn from it, and then we have to share the experience. It's rare that anybody gets this totally right the first time. So we're trying to build in the notion of pilots uh, to move this forward. Uh, Vietnam has really done a superb job, and I want to thank you not only for your efforts within your own country, uh, but this Interpol conference highlighting the trafficking issue is vital. I think everybody here knows when you're down to such small numbers of tigers, um, are probably our greatest danger right now is the trafficking and law enforcement issue. So to raise this in profile in the law enforcement community is very, very important. And uh, early in this project, we were able to work with some of the ASEAN countries led by Thailand to build a law enforcement network. Um, not surprisingly, this was an issue that didn't necessarily have the full priority uh, in this community, but what is now uh, a powerful element is people can see this linkage to broader organized crime networks. They can see the need to link it to the intelligence systems. They can see the need to link it to their customs systems. So we're really uh, starting to get uh, some momentum on this. I think some of the experience in Vietnam has also suggested that you can't just treat this as a law enforcement issue, either on the supply or demand side. To really embed this in a society, you need to connect this to public health and safety issues, the types of community support that was also talked about in Nepal, and education and broader communication strategies. So it has to have the multiple uh, dimensions. So we hope to work with Vietnam uh, and others in Southeast Asia on some of the lessons learned. Um, you also highlighted in the process the critical issue that I'm sure all countries and others are thinking about, which what are the resources? Well, I've mentioned some of the IDA uh, regional funds. We've been able to also uh, get some very good support from uh, the, the Jeff on some of the particular programs in wildlife. And recall, we did put together a multi-donor trust fund. And that's one reason why this meeting is a very important one. Uh, I've had some very high-level contacts with South Korea, Britain, Australia, countries that have an interest in this, but understandably, at a time that their taxpayers are under pressure, they're trying to say, what's for real? Where will this money go? How will it be specific? And so this type of activity will allow us to go back to them and say, these are the particular things where you may be able uh, to contribute to. Um, and in particular, to try to build on our experience in South Asia, we're now looking at a $18 million regional IDA project uh, for Southeast Asia focusing on the uh, illegal trade. You also asked about uh, the future of the Global Tiger Initiative. Well, we have a goal. I think it's always important to set a goal. So the goal set in Petersburg is to double the population of wild tigers. That's still a pretty small number, but would still, I think, give people a great sense of accomplishment if we're able to uh, achieve that. And so what we've seen with the Tiger Initiative is, in a way, we, we want to keep performing the role that we've been able to perform as a as a catalyst in the network. Um, 
we have uh, the good fortune of working with all the Tiger Range countries on a broader set of development issues, so we have those ties. Uh, we are in a position to try to figure out how to support them as it connects to other areas like green infrastructure where we're doing, for example, some interesting projects in India right now. We have the, uh, the good fortune to be able to work with NGOs, CSOs, scientific research community, uh, the bilateral donors. So we really want to continue to try to play this role of mobilizing support, but also what we have found is critical in everything we do in biodiversity, but more broadly in development, is we've got to track it. We've got to understand what's working. We've got to be able to find out what isn't working and be able to check the data through. So I think some of the lessons that we're also learning uh, from India about connecting the science and the data and, and the understanding of your populations is very key. India is obviously the country that is at the heart of this. When you look at the overall numbers, India uh, is the big player. Uh, we've been very appreciative of some of the support uh, that uh, we've seen more generally. We know this is a topic of great debate within India because there's been various efforts over the time. We want to learn uh, from the Indian experience and try to uh, share that with others. And I, again, I think that one of the things that we can try to do is build on some of India's experience in terms of the scientific monitoring and management effectiveness. I would love to be able to come uh, to see um, some of your parks, uh, whether in March or another month. I'm not sure my wife will ever forgive me, though, so that's why I have to try to work this out from a family uh, aspect. Um, so I think one of the aspects that w I'll just close with this point, um, you know, there's so many people in this room or part of this who have far greater expertise than we do at the World Bank. But where we've tried to hone our skills is trying to take the process of building knowledge, building experience in the field, feeding it back, developing a platform for others to draw on. And that's what we'd like to do in this area. So what we hope not only comes out of this conference and this work, but is the idea of trying to build this knowledge platform, and frankly, always keep in mind, as we do at the development institution, that the heart of this are the Tiger Range countries themselves. So we have to listen for their perspectives about where the needs are, and with your help, we'll also try to help fill some of the financing gaps. So thank you to Kishov, thank you to Rachel, thanks to all of you, and I know we've got some other participants here ready to speak, so I'll turn over to them. Mr. Zelik, thank you very much. And uh, some of the Indian Tigers might be also interested in seeing who's, who's leading all the initiatives on their behalf. So, yeah. <laughs> May I now request uh, Mr. Robert Homertz, who's the Under Secretary of State, United States, comment. And who's uh, here to speak today in a new capacity? He will soon be assuming the responsibility for the Bureau of Oceans and International Environment and Scientific Affairs. So, very welcome and thank you very much for coming today. Well, thank you very much, Keshav, and uh, thank you for your leadership and my old friend Bob Zelik uh, for your leadership uh, in driving this process in the bank. And I think we also. All of us owe a special thanks to Prime Minister Putin, who has really exerted enormous amounts of leadership in convening the St. Petersburg uh, summit on this very issue. Uh, on a personal note, before I begin, uh, very few uh, remarks on, on this. Uh, this issue really is very close to my heart. The big cats, uh, I fell in love with them when I was a graduate student in East Africa working on my dissertation. And I had a few extra months, so I got a job as a game guide in, uh, for photo safaris and spent a lot of time um, with the, uh, the lions of Serengeti and Amboseli and Gorongoro. Uh, so I was uh, particularly uh, touched by uh, these magnificent animals. And um, I also had the chance to see the tigers in India. Uh, several years ago, and I will encourage uh, Bob Zellick to come in March, <laughs> and I'm sure he can bring his wife. She'd probably have a great time. But uh, these are these are really, I think, very important issues and mean a lot. Anyone who's seen these wonderful animals and seen them in their habitat uh, can't feel anything but a deep connection to them and a real passion 
for the kind of things that are going on here and that all of you are enormous contributors to. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here also because uh, the bank has really done so much and because all of you have done so much and to celebrate the anniversary of the Tiger Summit in St. Petersburg that President Putin called and many, uh, many accomplishments of the range states that we've heard about uh, this morning and the Global Tiger Initiative and all of its accomplishments throughout the past year. The United States is very proud to be part of these impressive and indeed in many ways unprecedented efforts to save the roughly 3,200 remaining wild tigers and to increase their number dramatically, which is the goal of this program. We're committed to work towards this goal of doubling wild populations um, by the next year of the tiger, uh, 2022, and even going beyond that if possible because uh, this is something that's important, I think, to not only the range countries but to humanity in general. Over 100 years ago, um, in an address in Memphis, Tennessee, President Theodore Roosevelt said, the conservation of natural resources is the fundamental problem. Unless we solve that problem, it will avail us little to solve all others. This sentiment holds true today. Conservation remains a fundamental value of many of us here from many countries around the world and certainly very much to large numbers of Americans as well. And it's therefore an issue that merits global attention. That's why we're working in many areas and with many partners to promote sustainable development and best practices for using natural resources. Wild tigers, among the most iconic of animals, um, and they are iconic when you, when you see them and you see magnificent pictures of them, are at the center of much of our work to conserve biodiversity and conserve ecosystems all around the world. The United States has funded many efforts to conserve wild tigers in their natural habitats. Over the past 14 years, the U.S. Congress has uh, garnered bipartisan support, and as you know, bipartisanship in this country doesn't always come easily, um, bipartisan support to provide over $11 million for wide, wide wild tiger conservation programs, including nearly $2 million in 2010. And through our bilateral assistance uh, in uh, USAID, which Bob mentioned, uh, we provided over $10 million for conservation work throughout Asia in 2010. Much of this will help protect key tiger habitats. In addition to supporting the best science-based approaches to management, we all of us need to end the illegal trade in wildlife. This has been mentioned and it is a great crime not only against the tigers, but really a crime against humanity that has the opportunity to benefit from, from these tigers and from wildlife habitats around the world. The United States has provided political and financial support to establishing a global system of regional wildlife enforcement networks, including the ASEAN Wildlife Enforcement Network and the South Asian Wildlife Enforcement Network. We're committed to working closely with the International Consortium on Combating Wildlife Crime, as well as Interpol's new Project Predator, which specifically targets illegal trade in tigers and had earlier been mentioned. We will continue to look for innovative ways to achieve our conservation goals. One angle we're actively pursuing is the inclusion of strong environmental commitments in our free trade agreements, and this is something new uh, for the United States, but it's another way we can address these issues. For example, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations, which were recently advanced in the uh, summit that just took place in Honolulu, we're discussing proposals on new conservation issues, such as CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, and Sustainable Forest Management. TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, has the potential to be a model, not only for Asia and the Pacific, but for future trade agreements with other countries in other parts of the world. In addition, in the United States, we have strict civil and criminal penalties to protect both plants and wildlife through something called the Lacey Act, which I should note was signed into law in the year 1900. So this is a long-standing commitment by us 
and again, bipartisan in the Congress. In addition to covering the illegal trade of wildlife, the act has been amended in recent years to help promote the legal trade of wood products by increasing risks for illegal transactions and influencing choices that suppliers and consumers make about forest products. In Russia, for instance, high-value timber species provide key habitat for threatened species such as the Siberian tiger and the Far Eastern leopard. Reducing illegal logging in the Russian Far East reduces pressure on these tiger habitats. And one way of doing that is to restrict the trade in the products that these loggers engage in. We're here today because the poaching and illegal trade in tigers diminishes us all. It undermines our global conservation efforts and, it's threat and it threatens the economic and social fabric of local communities in many areas including the communities that are, have been mentioned this morning. I'm delighted to see the progress that we've made thus far, but as we all know, and as Bob pointed out in his statement, a lot more needs to be done. To save the tiger and meet our collective goals of doubling the number of tigers, we need to work together to redouble our efforts. This includes all of us, governments, civil society, and the private sector. I hope this event will continue to build the bridges among us and continue to build the commitment that we all have to addressing this highly important issue. I commend the bank for its leadership, pulling this group together, and to all of you, not only for your participation, but your enthusiasm, the fact that many of you have come from long distances, and the fact that we're all committed to this goal, which is not only important to tigers, which it obviously is, but it is also important to humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. May I now request Mr. Grishin, uh, our executive director from the Russian Federation, to say a few words. Uh, his office has been providing invaluable support, and uh, we are very proud to have, have him as a partner and a person who is leading this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, dear colleagues, friends, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Zelik uh, for his leadership, uh, for being so attentive to the issue. Russian government and our leaders pay special attention to tiger prevention as well. Um, uh, protection and uh, just one example. If you go to the personal website of the Prime Minister Vladimir Putin, uh, on the first page you will find a link to the Amur Tiger program and a number of other programs aimed at conserving uh, biodiversity among the priority issues under the personal uh, supervision. We will uh, necessarily pay special attention to this matter under the presidency of Russia in APEC. Um, I would like to use this opportunity in order to briefly inform you uh, on the past year outcomes. Work uh, on the conservation of tigers in Russia is conducted in three main directions. Protection of natural habitat, anti-poaching activity, and public awareness and human-wildlife conflict prevention. Uh, with regard to protection of natural habitats, a number of measures were taken, and some of them were mentioned by President um, Zelik. Uh, a ban on the logging of Korean pine. This concerns mainly the forest of Beacon River, which is nominated now to become a UNESCO World Heritage. We continue studying the biology of Amur tiger using radio and GPC tracking. We are in process of developing the full-size project proposal for funding from uh, Jeff to strengthen direct conservation action actions and capacity, monitoring wildlife-based ecotourism. In this area, we cooperate closely with other countries. It was established a Russian-China expert working group on transboundary management uh, of protected areas. A Russian-China agreement on cooperation and tiger conservation between Primorsky region, Russia, and Jilin, China province. Standardized standardize, uh, scientific uh, monitoring protocols were developed 
and now Russian Academy of Science works in close cooperation with Hokkaido University in Japan on uh, conducting a genetic analysis of gathered materials. We're working on creating a uh, nature refuge, uh, refuse Sredny uh, Usuriski as an ecological corridor connect Sihot Alin range in Russia and Wan Dashan in China. We made a number of important steps aimed at poaching prevention. This work uh, in underway on the amendment to the, to, of the criminal court and the court of administrative relations to increase punishment for killing tigers, storage and transportation of tigers, body parts and der derivates. Custom activity to control trafficking of tiger parts and derivatives uh, is strengthened. As a result, three large channels of illegal trade and export are blocked by custom this year. Primorsky and Khabarovsky administration strengthen anti-poaching brigades. Creation of a digital system and database for recording and monitoring poachers is underway. In the area of public awareness and human wildlife conflict prevention, we are focusing on organizing regional Olympiads, children's art and photographic competition, festivals, celebrations, gathering devoted to tiger conservation. Uh, we are working also on creating conflict tiger response teams in Primorsky and Khabarovsky region administration for preventing and resolving tiger-human conflicts, public awareness and education. Despite considerable progress, many challenges still remain, including direct poaching for tiger because of the demand for it at Russia and abroad. It still exists. Reduction, reducing the number of ungulates uh, in the northern part of the tiger range because of snowy winters. Quality deterioration of habitat is due to illegal logging and fires need for technical equipment of newly created structures. In conclusion, I would like uh, again to thank the World Bank Group and Mr. Zelik personally for the active participation in the initiative. Our joint efforts um, give us a ground to achieve sustainable positive results in this important and noble mission. Thank you. Mr. Grishin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zelik. Thank you very much for your presence and Under Secretary, as well as the Executive Director. Uh, we are now moving into the panel, and I'm cutting down my uh, speech because uh, I think we are about four minutes uh, behind. So the essential challenge for all of us is that what we talk here in these conferences and round tables actually puts the heat on the poacher and their legal terrorists. And that we should be able to fight fire with fire, which, I, which is a statement I love. Always wanted to say it, but uh, just couldn't say it. So there is direct action and fighting fire with fire. We need to really stop this scourge. And so over to, to the panel. Let me introduce the panel quickly. Uh, we have... Uh, Mary Melnick, who's the Senior Advisor, Natural Resource Management, United States Agency for uh, International Development. Mary has been instrumental in working to launch Interpol's Project Predator, and USAID AID has been very supportive of GTI. Vanda Brown, Fellow in Foreign Policy, Brookings Institution. Ms. Brown published an article that caught our attention earlier this year, The Disappearing Act, the Illicit Trade in Wildlife in Asia. She is an expert on illegal economies and their relation to counter insurgencies and even terror networks and brings a new angle to our discussion. Crawford Allen, <clears throat> one of our favorite colleagues, Regional Director Traffic, North America, uh, and it's always been a great uh, partner. Stephen Mumford, uh, who is the uh, director for Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, is the founding Smithsonian, the founding partner of the GTI, and Steve Mumford is the tireless director of the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. The first that Smithsonian are critical to GTIs and the Global Tiger Recovery Program's capacity building efforts. Dr. Richard Damania, lead environmental economist, Latin America and Caribbean. Richard and all of us actually 
took up uh, this initiative and Richard helped us uh, bring the idea of the GGTI to the World Bank. I know of no one who can communicate the messages of biodiversity conservation and tiger conservation as Richard does. Steve uh, Shackleton, Chief Ranger, U.S. National Park Service. Mr. Shackleton has been working in the Blue Chip, I thought it was Yellowstone Park, but it's the Blue Chip National Park System of the United States over an entire career, and has worked on seminal U.S. environment events such as the Exxon Valdez spill in Alaska and the BP spill in the Gulf of Mexico. He brings experience and important lessons for GTI to the table. We have also invited two colleagues. One is Dr. Errol Suthers, a formal uh, FBI Special Agent, President Barack Obama's first nominee for Assistant Secretary of the TSA and Governor, uh, honored, I can never pronounce this, Swarzenegger's Deputy Director for Critical Infrastructure of the California Office of Homeland Security. And Dr. Milin Tambe, Professor of Computer Science, Industrial and Systems Engineering at the University of Southern California. He leads the Team Core Research Group at USC with research focused on agent-based and multi-agent systems. His expertise relates to sharing of intelligence through new and innovative technology. May I now, with the permission of the chair, and if, uh, Richard, would you like to say something, uh, request Mary to initiate, and we go by the same uh, sequence that I talked about. Thank you, Keshav. Thank you for the introduction. I'd also like to thank the World Bank for the opportunity to be present on this panel, and an additional thanks for the, to the World Bank, President Zelik, staff such as Keshav, as well as the host country governments for their continued and sustained support to tiger conservation through the Global Tiger Initiative. Thanks, Keshav, for keeping the heat on us at all times. I'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize the coordination role that the United States State Department has had uh, through this initiative and the Global Tiger Initiative. Uh, they're the ones that bring all of us, USAID, Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service, uh, Smithsonian together, and with a combined U.S. government effort. Today, I'd just like to talk briefly about why USAID is engaged and talk about the new investments we've made since the Tiger Summit and some of our achievements and results from that. Similar to, to the World Bank and actually picking up on Under Secretary Hormatz's last comments about building bridges, uh, USAID finds building alliances very, very important, engaging all different kinds of stakeholders. And I'd like to go through and, and, and delineate my remarks based on those different types of stakeholders. The first one is a new partner for USAID, Interpol. This is the first time we've given them a direct grant uh, from aid for Project Predator. And we welcome working with the World Bank, the UK government, and Smithsonian on this major issue. You've heard numerous remarks on Project Predator. I just want to emphasize and reiterate one point that was made. In addition to the very important role police have, we want to really mainstream and institutionalize wildlife trafficking, tiger trafficking, among police and enforcement officials. They're critical. They're the most important link, I'd say, among the most important links to enforcement and the stopping of the wildlife trafficking and poaching. They're the ones that bring the evidence to court. They're the ones that prosecute and process. So we're very keen to work on that with you. Historically, you've also heard Under Secretary Hormatz talk about ASEAN Wildlife Enforcement Network. We've been over the past few years, along with the State Department, supporting the Asia, Southeast Asian Association uh, with pulling together these networks that include wildlife enforcement officials and have set up national task forces across ASEAN. Last year in St. Petersburg, my counterpart, Winston Bowman, announced an increased investment in this. And we're pleased to say that we have launched a new program with another important partner, Civil Society, the NGO Freeland Foundation, and a new program called ARREST. ARREST stands for Asia Regional Response to Endangered Species Trafficking. We're very pleased to say that from April to September of 2011, through ARREST and working with host country law enforcement officials, we've had 120 enforcement actions confiscating $7 million of wildlife products and parts. We also have other aspects of this program. You heard um, Krishna Acharya mention South Asia when. We're looking forward to bringing members of SAWEN to the ASEAN Program Coordination Unit. 
And we also have started a new China Wen. Uh, finally, I'll just close quickly in the interest of time to talk about our work in Nepal. We've launched two brand new programs there. One is regarding major conservation landscapes in the Tarai Arc landscape and in the Chitwan Annapurna landscape. It will have very important uh, tiger surveys done, conservation of biodiversity corridors, but also a critical element of that will be anti-poaching support with communities to begin at the very local level. So I've just outlaid you know, our range of stakeholders from Interpol, NGOs, civil society, local enforcement officials down to the community levels. The second project was mentioned by Krishna Acharya was, is the Nepal Tiger Genome Project. It will be the first of its kind to use the latest advances and tools in genetics to identify and track tigers. One important aspect, of course, will be population census and establishing the genetic database. But to keep on topic of today's panel, it will help in tra tracking where the poached animals have come from and their source. So this database will have wide applications for all of our efforts here. With that, I will say to that kind Keshav, I thank you and I look forward to building those bridges and any questions that you may have in further collaboration as we move forward in tiger conservation. Mary, thank you very much. We'll uh, like more to now move to Vanda. Just to keep your interventions as uh, succinct as you can, uh, because we would also like participation from the floor on this. So, uh, Vanda, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm uh, honored to be here, and um, uh, perhaps I can bring a perspective from other illegal economies and, and comparison with other illegal economies that makes managing the illegal trade in wildlife uh, very challenging. Uh, and I'll speak more broadly about illegal trade in wildlife, not simply trade in tiger parts. Well, one reason why this uh, managing or suppressing this illegal economy is particularly difficult is because of the um, volume and diversity of the traded wildlife products. One particular challenge, of course, is that the illegal trade coexists alongside illegal trade. And it is often crucially difficult for law enforcement to be able to determine whether the uh, traded uh, animal or traded uh, wildlife part is in fact legal or illegal. In the case of rhino horns or tigers, uh, that might be um, easy to do because all trade uh, is in those parts might be banned, but in the case of other wildlife products, that might not be uh, the case. Um, the, the second major challenge is that um, from law enforcement perspective, the wildlife trade is at the bottom of priorities. It is at the bottom of priorities for national governance, um, governments who often feel uh, little pressure and interest to be enforcing this traffic. It is at the bottom of priorities for uh, the officers who are tasked with it. Often they have no uh, possibilities of uh, promotions uh, and uh, often the resource intensiveness for effectively monitoring vast uh, areas and being able to distinguish between legal and illegal products is enormous. So for many, uh, even very dedicated officers, this is sort of the dead end career. Changing these dynamics in, in uh, prestige and status for a uh, law enforcement officer task for it uh, is a difficult but critical aspect. The third reason why this is uh, such a difficult illegal economy to manage is that uh, there is in fact a great complexity of actors involved in it. We have heard about fighting fire with fire and, and about going after poachers. Well, the reality is that some poachers are um, sort of the, the so sort of isolated criminal that can be um, uh, that can be sanctioned. That, uh, however, often large communities of people participate in illegal hunting. For many marginalized uh, populations around the world, bushmeat, uh, some of it sourced illegally, will be uh, often the only source or primary source of protein. Um, in areas such as Burma, uh, many former poppy farmers who, who would be producing uh, a poppy for the production of opiates uh, switched to uh, wildlife traffic after uh, the drug economy was suppressed in those areas. And often we are talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in a particular locale. Uh, whom um, 
more professional poachers and hunters um, exploit as well as connect. So changing the, the dynamics for a uh, local community is often uh, critical, but also very difficult. And uh, alternative livelihood efforts in the area of wildlife uh, preservation, both logging and wildlife trade, have been arguably even less effective than in the case of, for example, uh, drug economies. Yet ignoring um, the, the complexity of stakeholders, uh, zoos and farms that can serve as laundering mechanism for the illegal trade uh, would be very problematic. Finally, the economy is particularly difficult because there is in fact such a highly diverse demand. Uh, at the very crude level, you have uh, demand for protein, uh, so very poor uh, populations. At the other hand, you have uh, luxury demand by very affluent uh, consumers, be it for furs, curios, or uh, traditional Chinese medicine. And, and uh, traditional Chinese medicine is a particularly difficult um, um, demand aspect to manage. It's one that is expanding. And if one looks again at something like trucks, uh, it is driven by status, wealth, um, prestige, uh, all of which are often used as mechanism to suppress demand. But in this case, they work uh, to enhance demand. So changing that is very difficult. Um, I would conclude then that although there, are, there is a great need and possibility for improvement in law enforcement, law enforcement alone is not going to solve the issue. Uh, focusing on other mechanisms such as uh, developing economic incentives to preserve uh, will be critical. And again, the, the evidence there is often very difficult. Sometimes legal trade can uh, remove pressures on the ecosystem and the products, such as trade in crocodilians and other uh, times it doesn't work and it's not reducing the illegal trade um, as well. So a range of measures is, is needed, including critically reducing the mang, all of which are very challenging, but there are real limits to what law enforcement uh, will be able to do. Randa, thank you very much and thanks for sticking to a precise time. Uh, Crawford, you've just come back from Hong Kong, thank, I believe. Thank you, right? Kesha. Okay, so, hello, good morning. Um, to put my own perspective succinctly, I, I think the challenges facing wildlife from the excessive and illegal use and trade um, are really greater ed than ever before. Um, but the changes in the tactics and the, the recognition of the seriousness of the threat um, really are indicators to me that we may be in an era of new hope. Um, and as an optimist, I may be scoffed at by some more of my doom-mongering colleagues. But, um, I really think that in the past 20 years that I've been working on this issue, I've never seen such a high level of political interest and, and a coordinated responses to these threats. Um, so if we drill down and think about from the high level down to the community level, when we think about what really is driving poaching, many people think of the impoverished African with an AK-47 on one shoulder and the, the bloody ivory um, T um, tusk on the other shoulder walking out of the forest. Nowadays, when I think of, the, of, of what really is driving this, I'm thinking of the wealthy businessman who has a fake legal front to his business that is covering the illegal activities that are going on underneath. Um, so and our generalized view now is much more that, that the, um, the drivers of illicit wildlife trade really are increasingly wealth and greed, their pride and their fashion. Um, and perhaps this is even more so than poverty now, and that for, particularly for these mega commodities like ivory, tiger, tiger parts, and rhino horn. Um, and this changing view has seen this dramatic shift away from those traditional markets in North America and in Japan, much more now to being replaced with these scaled up operations, well organized criminal gangs using these high tech tools and communication systems, servicing increasingly some of the emergent economies and powerhouse economies in Asia. Um, if we look at the issue of, of rhinos, I mean, we estimate there'll be probably over 400 rhinos poached in South Africa alone this year. It's quite phenomenal uh, challenge, really just to meet this exclusive demand for a, a, a mythical belief that it cures cancer in Vietnam in particular. Um, and the situation is out of control. Um, there are urgent steps being, being made now to make some quick fixes and being backed up by some longer term strategies. Um, for example, there was a bilateral mission recently between South Africa and Vietnam, uh, and there was a, a coalition against wildlife trafficking um, rhino crisis workshop just recently in South Africa. Um, these are examples of efforts to, to deal with this. Um, and in this context, you know, I think all the people here and around this table really know how we need to address this issue and what we need to do. 
But we really need to convince the stakeholders. We need to win people over to engage and partner with us on this. I'll touch on a few areas on this right now. Um, of course, better governance through policy, uh, effective resource use, capacity building, transparency, anti-corruption measures really are at the top of our list in terms of our priorities. Um, but, and also this, this, this issue we've already heard about, about integrating these elements into broader agendas such as security and health. But governance, as we've heard, is, really does require effective enforcement and cooperative approaches of intelligence sharing, targeted operations, regional enforcement networks, and some targeted strikes on organized crime groups really are the things that are moving forward pretty effectively. Um, and we've heard also that mainstreaming wildlife crimes and other cri criminality it really is paramount moving forward. Technology, obviously, is, is something that really is being explored and being quite effective now and, and to both track, track the illicit trade but also to keep the legal trade watertight and not allow that leakage um, and to detect the fraud and money laundering. Um, and DNA work now that the, is, is quite amazing in what's being done in forensics. Um, so I think um, Richard will touch on this a lot more, but for sustained, su sustained success, um, the methods to, to shift society's um, understanding and beliefs systems to recognize the wider implications of this loss of wildlife and find alternatives really are required urgently. It's going to be a struggle, um, and it's vital to build that sense of stewardship um, within these communities that do coexist where, where wildlife are in demand for trade. But also, <coughs> private sector work really is, is building and picking up, and initiatives that can bring their support, resources, and self-policing um, are really already underway you know, with the transport sector, with the um, industry, industry groups, even auction houses, fashion houses. Um, in closing, I just wanted to stress that government enforcement agencies' priorities are based largely on economic um, uh, aspects and security and social issues like drugs and guns, and we need to do better in articulating to them why, why wildlife crime can have serious ramifications as well for economic security and social issues too. And we need more of those smoking guns based on objective analysis that can build up this thorough picture of the scale and the nature and the criminality and the lost incomes that, that this, this loss of wildlife to black market brings. Um, we will do better. We are going to do better. And I think that species-specific trade approaches, as we've heard with the GTI, really are important to catalyze action. Um, but they do need to be implemented closely in tandem with generic programs to build governance and demand reduction. Um, and others more broadly. Um, there, these are daunting tasks ahead of us, but I think that these initiatives and the signs of these joined up global approaches and reaching the highest levels of political attention really are paying off. Um, so for Traffic, the, who I work for, and, and its parent organizations, WF and IUCN, um, we're part of this global community and we're trying to work together on this response and we're looking for new partners and new ways to, to mitigate these threats. And, um, I really hope that you can consider joining with us on that mission. Um, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Crawford. We have 10 minutes, and we got three panelists. Uh, request you, uh, I'm saying 10 minutes because there'll be interventions from the floor as well as some of the, all the Tiger Range countries are connected. So Steve, uh, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the Smithsonian is, is committed to developing the human capacity that's needed to help sustain biodiversity on Earth. And there's no other species that's more iconic than the tiger. We're particularly proud of the partnerships that have been developed out of the GTI, uh, especially with our Tiger Range country counterparts, our NGO partners, and many others. Um, ultimately, though, it's the Tiger Range countries themselves that must implement effective conservation efforts where it matters most, on, on the ground. And so our, our capacity building efforts are focused on, emp on empowering protected area management uh, and their field level staff to conserve tigers on the front lines of conservation. And so with the support of the World Bank, we're joining together with uh, our partners in tiger range countries as well as our NGO partners to develop uh, a number of initiatives. First, uh, we're developing core learning programs that cover the best practices in the disciplines most important for tiger range uh, country protected area management. We're implementing training courses uh, for leaders and their staff from priority protected areas from the tiger range countries, and then we're trying to scale that up uh, to reach a broad range of frontline staff. We're establishing an online web portal and a community of practice or practices to ensure that all tiger conservation practitioners have access to the information and help and support that they need. And finally, we're supporting effective law enforcement practices on the front lines within protected areas and trying to complement the domestic and the international efforts 
uh, to disrupt the international trade routes and halt illegal trade. So just in summary, um, I would say that the Smithsonian is prepared to do its part in helping to achieve the goals set out at the uh, Tiger Summit in St. Petersburg and to help to double the t number of tigers by 2022. Thank you. Well, you saved 40 seconds. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. I can see how precise and productive the Smithsonian partnership is. Uh, may I ask Richard Demania uh, and to dwell on, a little on demand issue which you discussed on. Thank, thank you very much. Um, my primary task at hand is to describe the outcomes of a recent workshop that I'm just back from in Hong Kong, which was run by Traffic, which was enormously successful on trying to find innovative approaches for managing demand. Before I go there, I'd just like to just make a very few generic comments. In some senses, we would have achieved the goals of GTI and tiger conservation if a very simple equation can be satisfied. That is, that a live tiger is worth more than a dead tiger. At the moment, a dead tiger is worth everything, and a live tiger is a liability. So in going, going down that path, some of, the, some of the initiatives we've heard about today, like the wildlife premium market, are really, really terribly important. Another initiative that we've heard about from Vanda and a couple of other people about enforcement, that's really important too, trying to enforce the laws that actually exist and stop poaching. But of course, that's extremely, extremely difficult because we have large, porous boundaries in our national parks, and it's really, really difficult to catch poachers. In addition to that, we're dealing with organized crime. And anyone that's known any efforts that, have, that has worked with organized crime well, you know, the solutions remain elusive. So perhaps one way to address this problem is to tackle the root cause of the problem. The root cause of the problem is demand and demand for tiger parts. But as we heard from Vanda and we heard from Crawford, it's a very, very complex market with many elements to it. There is uh, demand for the medicinal, there's a medicinal demand for tiger parts, which has its roots way back into deep traditions. There are the presumed health benefits of consuming tigers, and there's a demand based on curios, there's a prestige demand for skins, and there's this newfangled stuff like tiger bone wine, which seems to have no basis in anything, but it's just a fashion that's caught on. As we've also heard, there seems to be a lot of evidence that this is really a prestige consumption. And a lot, of the, a lot of the consumption is based on gifting and is deemed to be something which is honorable to do for both the giver and the recipient and the fact that you're actually taking a risk and actually con conferring this gift on others. Given this background, given the complexity, Traffic organized this workshop last week in Hong Kong. It brought together a variety of experts, those from advertising, trying to reveal the dark secrets and dark arts of advertising, how they get us to buy things we don't really need or want. Can we reverse that? Um, there were people from social change, trying to see how we can get people to change their behaviors. And from the World Bank side, we contributed in behavioral economics. And that's, this is, for those of you that don't know, this new field of economics that tries to understand how people make choices. At some levels, it's relatively benign. It talks about how we can get people to eat healthier food or avoid petty crime, etc. So how can we come to creative solutions? Well, what we know is that the conventional approaches we think probably haven't worked. So if we see pleading through billboards and advertisements we know that that's had very limited impact. There's many billboards saying, you know, don't kill tigers, don't consume rhino horn and whatever, and it doesn't work. So how can we actually drill a little bit deeper and get things to work? There was a broad consensus that research seems to inform us that peer group pressure matters a lot more, word of mouth matters a lot more, and inc incidental effects, the kind of subliminal keys that we can push when you're consuming something, tends to work a lot better than simply saying to people, don't do something. In the spirit of that, the workshop identified what we thought were three agents of change that might be able to tackle this problem of prestige and the gift giving. First would be the business elites, because they're the ones that seem to cons consume the stuff, and they're the ones that seem to give the stuff away as gifts. And of course, what, we want, what you really want to do is turn a gift, which is now an asset, into really what, is, what, would, what could be deemed as a liability. Um, and the workshop did identify some champions, and there does seem to be some useful initiatives. Probably most of you don't know, but the website in China, Alibaba, has banned the advertising any wildlife product whatsoever. And that's a very, very useful first step that we can build upon. There isn't the time here to go to the other aspects of it. The second major catalyst of change in any society, of course, are the youth. So next great challenge is how can you get the youth to persuade everyone that it's really uncool to consume tiger products or to have a piece of ivory sitting on your, on your shelves in your home. This is not prestigious, it's, 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 it's precisely the opposite. And finally, of course, nothing's going to work without government being in the camp and firmly on board with this. Um, the workshop is going to produce the obligatory report. That's going to be followed by what we hope would be concrete actions with governments that, will, that would take place in a reasonably well-defined way. 
In, in the more short term, uh, one, of course, needs to drill down much more into how one's going to roll this out. So there's going to be opinion analysis, the what, the how, and the who. And finally, what really has been missing in the whole demand management is, is an evaluation mechanism. There's been lots of billboards, lots of money spent in places, but we don't really know what works. So I think having an evaluation mechanism would be really important. And thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, may I now request Steve Shackleton to make his remarks. Well, it's a privilege to be here today, and my wife, were she sitting here, would be intrigued to know that I have three minutes to talk about anything, let alone something as serious as wildlife preservation. The United States National Park System is comprised of about 84 million acres, contains almost 400 parks now, and is visited by half a billion people per year. And the mission of the National Park Service in the United States is to keep these places unimpaired so that 200 years from now, 400 years from now, these ecosystems are as intact as they are now. Clearly, that can't be done alone. It requires partnerships. Part of what I represent is law enforcement. And last year, we, we had about 1,200 poaching cases that we prosecuted. When you stop and think about 1,200 poaching cases with 500 million people visiting, it's a pretty small number. One of the reasons I think it's small is because we approach poaching with a systems approach. Education has to be first and foremost, and both Vonda and my partner here to the left have mentioned the importance of youth and the importance of projecting through youthful voice what's cool and what's not cool. Part of that requires education, and education always requires science. And what we're finding is that law enforcement has to have a passionate relationship with research universities and other research entities. As the tiger protection countries experience the sophistication of the poachers and become more adept at making those wildlife cases, I predict that the attorneys who protect the people who are poaching are also going to become more skilled. Once again, education and science need to be on our side. We need to understand things like the tiger genome project. We need to be able to prove that these products came from these animals as defenses become more sophisticated as well. One of the things that keeps coming up is the idea of economics. It's very difficult, and you put it eloquently a minute ago, it's very difficult to argue for a live tiger when a dead tiger produces a livelihood for a whole village, perhaps, or entrepreneurs in that village. We have to be able to find surrogates for economies, and I know that many of you here on the panel are, are already working on this around the world. But I would propose that in the United States, the existence of those 400 national parks brings in over $3 billion of revenue directly per year, and we don't know how many indirect dollars of revenue are produced by their existence. One of the ways that I, I think the U.S. National Park Service might be able to participate and help is through um, the lending of our analogous lessons. We're fond of saying in the U.S. National Park Service that like doctors or lawyers, we practice ecosystem management. We never know as much about it as we wish we did. We never know as much about the law enforcement as we wish we did. We have to be scientifically curious we have to be economically curious, and we have to be curious and educational about our legislators and the people who many times don't get it. And we have to be there for them, as well as the, as the young people and the people who are out there who could potentially violate the law. One of the things that the American National Park Service uh, does not allow is impairment. And uh, there's a fine line between impact and impairment. If you kill one tiger, that might be an impact. If you kill the ecosystem that that tiger occupies, that's an impairment. So I'll wrap up by, by saying that we understand very well in this National Park Service that we have to be partners on a global scale. 
We have to know where our migrating animals go when they're not in our national parks. We have to work with those other host countries. We have to understand zoonotic diseases. We have to understand epidemiology. We have to understand economics. And we've established an entity called the um, National Parks Institute that has a leadership and management seminar. Uh, we'd like to make that available for the Global uh, Tiger Initiative Parks. And uh, in every other respect, be there to be of assistance as well as students of your technologies and the lessons that you're learning. Thank you. Steve, thank you very much. Uh, we are, uh, I, there'll be last intervention from uh, Errol Suthers uh, or through the USC, if you would like to say some uh, something or uh, Milan, you have two minutes and then I'm going to open this at exactly 11.45 to, uh, to the floor and do you do you want to say something or yeah Melon would you like to say something? Yeah, from the FBI. Mm -hmm. After him, you can say a few words I'll turn it around. I'm uh, Melin Tambe from uh, University of Southern California from the Computer Science Department. It's uh, I'm here with my colleague. Uh, Errol Southers, uh, we are both parts of the CREATE uh, National Center for Excellence of uh, uh, DHS. So I'm really honored to be, uh, to be here. I was really inspired to hear all of the remarks uh, from all of the panelists and all of the honorable speakers. Our expertise is in bringing uh, technology uh, in terms of computer science expertise in figuring out how to optimally use limited security resources in deploying them for protecting uh, different infrastructure. Our software that we've developed is uh, currently in use at uh, the LAX airport, for example, for placement of checkpoints and canine patrols by the US Federal Air Marshal Service for placing air marshals on flights. Uh, it's being uh, evaluated by the US Coast Guard in the port of Boston and also in the port of New York uh, in the future for uh, optimal patrolling schedules and so forth. So given all of that we've heard today in terms of um, uh, patrolling and schedules for anti-poaching activities, we feel that we may have an opportunity here for potentially uh, supplying some technology from me and a whole range of colleagues who work in this field. And so we would be delighted to be of any help. Thank you very much, uh, Milan. I'm just... Uh Mixing up uh, the protocol a little, I'm asking the chair, for whom uh, who has to leave, to uh, make uh, some comments, and then we'll open it to uh, everyone. And then we are, as you know, going to listen to some tiger music after this. Uh, so don't go away. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I, I think it's been absolutely fascinating to listen to the panel members, um, uh, but also to Secretary Hormats uh, in terms of. Uh, his commitment and the U.S.'s commitment to um, tigers um, for tigers' sake, but also um, how much we can learn about the uh, multidisciplinary approach we're going to have to bring, uh, not only to tiger conservation, but to the whole um, decades-long, uh, multiple decades-long effort to try to find the right way to value uh, biodiversity and the, the, the diversity of life. Um, I thought what was interesting in the panel is that we do know a lot more now than we, we knew 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And in particular, um, as we understand the, the, the complexities and the dynamism of the demand driver and what we can do about that. I mean, I, I was struck not only by um, you know, the recent decision by Alibaba, but also you know last week the Peninsula Hotel Group. Um, made it uncool to have shark fin soup for your wedding, right? So, um, and in fact, banned it throughout their, their their entire their entire chain. So, I think that there is this opportunity to speak to uh, the new generations of consumers who um, are driving uh, are driving aspects of this business in a way that uh, traditional methods of, of appeal, as Richard mo noted, just don't work. Um, it is those generations that are going to be the key to it. And it's going to be those generations that also um, are prepared to support the kinds of uh, work that I think we do have to do in order to um, 
uh, have effective enforcement and to um, uh, bring some uh, some seriousness to that, so that you know there is a, there is a disincentive as well. So you've got both carrots and, and sticks. Um, you know the, the luxury goods market. Um, you know I have a private sector background. Uh, the luxury goods market in China. Uh, and this is for you know non uh, animal parts luxury goods is going to be bigger than the whole world's market for luxury goods b within I think three years, and so we, we know that uh, grappling with this and having the range countries really be in the driving seat is the only sustainable way forward. So I think that with the sophistication of our analysis around what is happening to demand, with the buy-in of and the leadership of the range countries, and then also with, uh, I think, a, a, a pragmatic, forceful approach to, to enforcement, again, using new technology and new partnerships, um, I think that this is a, a different, it feels different, and it is different in terms of an approach to conservation, to protection, and therefore as a way into the kinds of coordinated multidisciplinary approaches that are going to be essential to biodiversity conservation over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, so I think that uh, you uh, personify um, uh, the effort that is needed coming from every walk of life and coming from all kinds of different agencies. And um, as Mr. Zalik said, you can be assured um, that the management of the World Bank Group takes this very seriously. It is for us a test in some ways uh, of whether we can bring our multidisciplinary talents to bear on an issue like this and then whether we can take the learning from this and play it back out into our entire approach to biodiversity. The work that we're doing on wealth accounting is a good example of that. Uh, people have been talking about and working on environmental economics and different measures of environmental accounting for, for many decades. But we are now at the point of actually having countries prepared to pilot a new approach to wealth accounting. And uh, we hope that um, you know, that small snowball will grow into something that becomes a true force for good. So uh, I'm afraid I, I have to disappear and take care of something else. But thank you for your partnership. Thank you, Kasha, for organizing today. And please be um, assured of our commitment in the World Bank Group. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, we'll, of course, uh, be seeing you soon, uh, even for a short uh, while. Um, uh, like you to inspire us in this uh, concert. But may I now request the mem members on the floor, the dignitaries who are here, if they would like to say something, and I'd like them to come to the podium and make comments. Uh, also introduce yourself before you make the comment. as the dean has agreed to say a few words. <laughs> yeah, and uh, if there, is, there are any questions or comments from the Tiger Range countries, um, they are most welcome. Of course, I saw Yadav uh, polishing off some samosas uh, while the video was going on, but uh, still, I can, uh, if you have some questions, go ahead. There you go. Uh, Kesho, can I ask one question? Okay, just there is an intervention from uh, Mr. Azadine from IFO. After that, you can ask the question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Azadine Downs uh, from the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Uh, Keshav's uh, definition of volunteering is taking on new meaning. Uh, <laughs> but just very quickly, at um, one of the things that I continue to hear uh, from our colleagues in the field is that the most important thing we can do is to try to uh, concentrate on actions on the front lines and, and, and translating all of that we do to ensure that, in fact, um, the Tiger Range countries are getting the, the resources that they need is, is absolutely critical. Uh, at IFA, we have um, concentrated our efforts uh, in Russia, China, India, and most recently in Bhutan with capacity building. Um, we've helped train over 7,000 frontline rangers in India. Um, and most recently, uh, we heard this morning that there's work um, with grants from USAID through the Freeland Foundation, uh, of which we are a sub-granting partner. Um, in efforts to reduce consumption in China. 
so that is, those are the things that uh, the International Fund for Animal Welfare have been working on. Uh, and so thank you for your time. Mr. Yadav, uh, the floor is open for you here. Thank you, Keshav. Uh, I just, um, I have a sense of urgency that everybody knows that India has most of the wild tigers in the world. And if you see, we have more than 5,000 uh, guards, tiger guards working in the f field, which whom I, we call the frontline staff. And I have a sense of urgency for their capacity building regarding enforcement, regarding patrolling, and use of all modern technology. Uh, this Global Tiger Initiative, the movement at global level, has connected all the TRCs. Uh, I'm wondering how this sense of urgency goes into the frontline level, and my uh, forest guards who are leading in the front were fighting daily battle with poachers, land mafia, and coachers, how their capacity can be built within a short period of time. Can GTI be of any help to this? Thank you. If, uh, can I just uh, respond to it? Because this is a very pertinent question, and scaling the capac capacity building program is of most importance. Now, GTI and its partners can create co-branding, partnerships at the national level to actually uh, cascade our efforts at the local level. Actually, Mahindra uh, is already, Mahindra Sheshta is working on the possibilities of going uh, down from national to the subnational and then absolutely at the park level. So uh, we are completely, we, we do feel that unless the forest uh, uh, forester guards and the rangers uh, are fully equipped, this is not going to work. And therefore, there is a lot of focus, and we are delighted to be of service in this. Questions from the floor or anybody else? Uh, uh, is there any other question from the uh, tiger, tiger Range countries? I know it's too late there. Yes sir. yes, sir, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. From Nepal? Yeah. Actually, I am also very much, you know, in the same line with what uh, SP says from India. Uh, we, we, our frontline staff, I think they never receive any kind of training. And uh, they are very, you know, uh, again, that is very important for their capacity building, incentivization, and other things. Uh, so, just you know, having one or two taught kinds of thing, training are not enough. That's why in the, my question I put that we need more money and very strong commitment on the field, on the ground, actually, how that can be achieved in quickly terms. And I, I also have some frustration from international, you know, NGO working on this field and promises have never been achieved and realized in the field, actually. We discussed some of the colleagues in last meeting in India, and we were told that there will be a mission, and we have some urgent, important, you know, training to be conducted for those frontline staff. I saw some of the faces in the screen there, but I think those kinds of negotiations have never really come on the ground. That is a very frustrating. Thank you. Uh, I think this is a very pertinent issue, and... Uh... Our effort is to make sure that our promises convert into action. But it's not going to be easy uh, because the first issue is to what extent global partners and GTI and others can really go. How deep can we go into this? So you have to uh, uh, make sure that from the national side there is an institutional architecture which has the capacity to, to absorb the benefits that uh, these global partnerships can bring. It's extremely important that you look at it from that point of view. Don't feel frustrated, uh, Mr. Krishna Acharya. We will soon be sitting with you in Chitwan, and we will be discussing this. There are potentials in the regional projects as well as other uh, the Smithsonian GTI partnerships, then uh, with other uh, NGO partners, I4, WWF, WCS, and all our partners uh, here. Uh, and we used to completely focus in the front lines. And that is, we understand the importance of it. So thank you very much for your concern, and we would like to make sure that all of us uh, stay focused on that. Okay, I would uh, 
now presume that there are no money and not many questions and you want to hear tiger music and which is that the atrium incidentally we have uh karen davis who is a uh, globally famous performer a pianist whom i met uh, incidentally uh, on the plane and we talked about tiger then she's so inspired to to start a series of concerts on uh, on tiger conservation and on uh, on wildlife and other things it's amazing that she's doing it completely free and she's been here giving her time to all this she she's absolutely magical but in uh, before we end i'd like to recognize his excellency ambassador paolo zampoli for his support to the tiger cause mr domingo zapata the painter and there are two paintings if you can just bring them in front uh, you want get up yeah, yeah, yeah. get up hurry up <laughs> you are the youth you are the youth we need to need action from your point and uh, then uh, mr pras michel singer of the fugees who are all here uh, and yuan is bringing uh, all these diverse uh, interesting elements into it here the, uh, they are presenting this painting to the world bank uh, for we can keep it for some time and so mm, it's keep really so truly we have at least yeah. 10000 yeah okay thank you so uh, we are very grateful um, half of the bank thank you uh, let me thank thank you thank you thank you very much so what we are seeing is that in addition to guns and other uh, softer methods of uh, dealing with poachers we are now bringing music and art into this whole subject which is also necessary because the music that tiger makes and the way he he makes the forest come alive is extremely important so we are finishing exactly on the dot and i like to really thank all of you for your uh, patience with me I, if i have been uh, impatient about time uh, please uh, forgive me for that but thank you very much mr ambassador and everybody uh, here for your uh, presence and uh, from the government state uh, from the US government and other experts and we will from here go to the atrium there is there is a, a appropriate seating arrangement there and from there after 40 minutes we will go for lunch so thank you very much once again and uh, mr yadav uh, mr krishna acharya the delegation from vietnam all my colleagues who have worked tireless, tirelessly throughout both uh, in the tiger range countries in vietnam uh, lan and in um, uh, uh, anupam and benedict and everybody else who have really done a great job gayatri Uh, for for your support i'd like to thank my colleagues here uh we have a small staff in the secretariat we are just about 6 to 7 people uh and we have to reach to the foresters 5000 forest guards in only in india so there is 25000 people so it's a pretty interesting agenda i like the challenge so once again thank you very much we go ahead mr mr kushlin do do i have your permission to hold this up Okay. And Richard, is it okay? Yes, you may proceed. Thank you. All right. <laughs> thank you very much. So, to the atrium, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. <laughs>